Teresa, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Teresa Ponte. I'm the chair of uh, the Journalism and Media Department. And we are in the process of starting our fourth lecture on the, on the media in contemporary society. Today's conversation will be with Matthew Kaminsky, editor-in-chief of Politico and editor and founder of Politico um, uh, Europe. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of a background on, on Mr. Kaminsky before we start. Um, he has reported on international affairs and politics and business uh, for about a quarter of a century. Uh, he covered the former Soviet Union for the Financial Times and The Economist, and in 1997 joined the Wall Street Journal in Brussels as a correspondent. He subsequently held various writing and editing positions at, at the Journal in Paris and New York. Uh, and in, in 2004, he was awarded the Peter White's Prize by the German Marshall Fund for a series of stories on the European Union. His coverage of the Ukrainian crisis won an Overseas Press Club Prize in 2015. And he was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in commentary that year. He joined Politico in late 2014 to become the founding editor of the European edition, which launched in April 2015. He moved to Washington in the fall of 2018 to help lead the publication's global expansion efforts and took on the current role in April 2019. Mr. Kaminsky was born in Poland. He immigrated to the United States as a child and grew up in Washington. He holds degrees from Yale College and, at, and from the University of Paris, and he lives in, in Washington. Welcome, uh, Matthew Kaminsky, uh, to, our, to our series. And uh, thank you for, for, being, for being with us. Uh, let me just uh, introduce you to uh, John Stack, who is the founder and dean of the uh, Stephen J. Green School of um, in International and Public Affairs. Uh, John? Thanks very much, Teresa. Great to hear from you. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Green School, I'm delighted to welcome everybody to our fourth installment of this compelling series. Uh, we are proud to join the School of Communication and Journalism to host these conversations with leading figures in journalism and the media. Uh, while Teresa Ponte has given us Matt Kaminsky's bio and background, I want to acknowledge Matt's familiarity with the Green School and with FIU. Matt has been a regular participant at our annual State of the World Conference, so he knows FIU, the quality of our students, and he loves having a good reason to come to Miami, especially Matt in the winter. On our last State of the World, uh, our last State of the World was a virtual event, but I certainly expect Matt that we will be able to host you in person for the fifth State of the World Conference next January. We're grateful that you have become a regular here at FIU, whether in person or remotely. Uh, it's so important for our students to hear from someone with your vast experience covering politics and global affairs. You've reported overseas as well from here in the US and now you are editor in chief of one of the leading organizations in the country. That kind of experience is invaluable for students to hear about and learn from. Politico is an important resource for many of us and you have an impressive team working with you, including here in the state of uh, Florida. Before surrendering the mic, I wanna briefly acknowledge the Green family whose support helps make today, today's event possible through our Dorothea Green Lecture Series. We are so grateful to Ambassador Green, his wife, Dorothea Green, and daughter, Kimberly Green, for all they have done for the school. And now I'd, I'd like to turn it over to my friend and my colleague, Senior Fellow David Kramer, 
who I know is also a friend of Matt's, dating back to their trip together to Ukraine more than a decade ago. David, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, John and, and Teresa. Thank you for, for the welcome and introduction. And uh, Matt, a, a warm welcome back to you, um, albeit virtually. So sorry you're not down here with us, but we'll, we'll fix that in a few months, I hope. Um, so thanks very much for joining us. And uh, let's, let's jump right into it. And, and what I'd like to do for those who are watching, um, Matt and I will have a, a back and forth for a while, and then we'll turn to questions that you may have. Uh, feel free to send them in through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I think everyone's familiar with that after all these months on, on Zoom. So uh, Matt, let's, let's jump right in. And, and as, as Dean Stack said, you've been with some of the leading news outlets in the business, the FT, the Economist, Wall Street Journal, and now Politico, uh, Politico since 2014. And you've risen to be editor in chief uh, since April, 2019. What, tell us what drew you to Politico and how is it different from the other places where you have worked? Well, David, it's really great to be here. Uh, uh, thank you to both John and Teresa for the warm welcome. I've already got January uh, uh, penned in my calendar, so I look forward to seeing you then, if not before. Um, I, you know, when I was approached by Politico in 2014, uh, Politico was still one of the sort of new digital uh, media upstarts. And I had spent uh, about 20 years by then uh, at a very big, a very stately, but it seemed kind of uh, a stately ships uh, that maybe had seen their better days uh, in, 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 a different, in a different era. Um, you know, and this was, it took me a while to get my head around this because when I came out of university, uh, the path was still then fairly uh, straightforward and frankly kind of conventional, but it was still the path that I and a lot of my friends uh, coming out of that generation of journalists saw as being, you know, join a great newspaper that again at the time was primarily or on, at the time was only publishing in, in print and you can have a globetrotting career uh, uh, a job security and, and, and the life that previous generations of journalists had. And the internet kind of, you know, spoiled our party. And then uh, Politico kind of spoiled our party and places like Politico that came along and said, no, there's a different way to do this. Um, there's a different way to do this that you should really deliver news and information to people the way they are, uh, they want to consume it and not force them that you must get your news in that morning newspaper. Uh, that lands on, on your doorstep. I mean, this sounds uh, pretty obvious right now, but actually at the time was, uh, it took us, uh, I would say journalists are uh, kind of small C conservative. We, we really don't like change very much. And, and I think uh, it took a little while for my profession to get its head around doing things differently. Um, so in any case, we, I, when Politico approached, I, I said, well, maybe I just need to try something different. And it was really the opportunity to sort of find a different model for journalism that was going to help pay for journalism that was going to be really open to change and to trying to figure out is, you know, we care about the profession a lot, but we have to adjust to the changing times. And, um, and I must say, since then, Politico has gone from being an upstart to now being a publication with uh, over 500 journalists uh, spread across the world. And it's gratifying to see that the places that I came from, which was the FT and the Wall Street Journal, um, but also the, the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, sadly not too many of the more uh, local, uh, regional newspapers who've also figured out you know, how to do great work, but also find a great business model to, uh, to support it. Um, and lastly, it was just an adventure, you know, sort of starting something from scratch in Europe where we have a joint venture with um, Axel Springer, it's one of the biggest publishers there. Uh, uh, that was just, it was just really impossible to say no to. And, and it's been a, a very surprising six years, but, you know, in all our careers, I think David agrees with me too, we should be surprised. We should, we should, we should do things that we may not have expected to do at, at sort of one point, but, but then, um, you know, kind of uh, find that um, incredibly gratifying to 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 try new things. You you you've been, as you said, um, and and as Teresa mentioned in her introduction of you, 
uh, you've been based in Europe. You started the Political Europe. Um, you've been based in the U.S. Uh, as well. Um, which is better, uh, being a U.S.-based journalist or being overseas? I mean, I think there's an old sort of joke that if only you, you could live in Europe and work in America at the same time, <laughs> that that would be the the, the, the more ideal. Um, you know. Uh, I was more of a Europeanist for a lot of my career. And I think it was partly because my personal background, you know, my, my parents fled communist Poland in 1980 when I was just turning, um, I, was, I was still a kid. And, and I felt that, you know, Europe, we have this image of Europe here as the old world and, and a place that uh, feels pretty static. It's a museum piece. And, and in some ways it is, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful museum piece and the cities are beautiful and culture is so old. And yet, Europe's never finished, you know, and, and I think we've underestimated, we, there's been a lot more just foundational ferment in Europe than in America. And I've been lucky to see some of the positive things that come out. You know, my, my first job in journalism, I was a high school kid and I got a, um, I convinced the New York Times bureau chief in Warsaw, uh, this guy, John Tagliabu. It was, um, I think, probably was May of 1989. Could I come and fill in in your bureau and just, you know, go for around? And it was impeccable timing. It was probably the best story I've ever covered. You know, it was 1989. You saw the fall of the Cold War. Yeah. Um, then you saw, you know, that a lot of borders changed hands. There were some bloody wars in Europe. And so Europe is actually quite a exciting place to cover because it is truly those tectonic plates in Europe. <laughs> both the physical ones in terms of sort of borders and people, unfortunately, but also Europe itself as a construct is not finished. Um, and, I've, and I think that remains the case. I was just there a few weeks ago and, and you know, the European Union, which it took for granted for so long, I, I, I wouldn't make a uh, even bet on it being here in 15 years, maybe something else will be. So that was just fascinating for, for me to cover. Um, you know, America is, I mean, there's so much energy in this in this country and, and in this story, as we saw the last five years. Um, and, and yet, even as this sort of the place seems so chaotic, actually, America has had the same constitutional system since the late 1700s. And there's not really any countries that I can think of that that you could say the same thing about. Um, uh, so, uh, in a way, sort of in America, we kind of have, you know, we we have kind of this sort of bedrock of of stability, and yet. There's so much, you know, that I think our social changes here and social economic changes here are so much more profound and they affect the world. And, and you can't really understand what's gonna happen in the world unless you understand America. So coming back to the original trip, I think you have to, I've, I've been lucky to be able to do both. Um, I probably enjoy vacations in Europe a tad bit more. And I think the restaurants are still probably a little bit better, but um, you know, the, the, this country remains such an incredible laboratory of ideas and, 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 you know, it's also unfinished America, but in a different sense than, than, than Europe. The DC restaurant scene, you have to admit, has gotten a hell of a lot better than when you first uh, arrived low, in the U.S. From a very low bar, David, from a very low bar. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, <laughs> You've also had experience, well, most news organizations have a news side and then an editorial side, and, and you've had the fortune of, of working on both sides of that. Um, which have you found more fulfilling? Again, they're both quite different, and I think if, if any people who are on the call are looking, thinking about journalism, I, I would... Uh, probably say uh, a start on the news side. I, I do think there is a purity to news. And there's a reason why I probably came back to the news side eventually. I think there's a there's nothing more fun, especially when you're young. But I think this is true of any age where you are empowered to ask anyone, whether no matter how mighty or, or how low, you are at, you are sort of, you, you have the power to ask questions. And you're also, I think it's something that we work on very much in the newsroom that is, uh, and these are the values that I grew up with in, in journalism that we're, you know, uh, in some ways fighting to, to sort of keep alive is, you know, when you, when you are a reporter, you should have an open mind. You should really try and look at the world and grapple with it the way it is, uh, not the way that you wish it to be. Um, and, and that's one of um, their... Uh, I've, 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 I think that's, that's really has always been one of the great values of, of, of uh, especially American style news journalism. 
um, news reporting um, that I worry that in Europe and I worry that in America actually we're losing a little bit of touch with that where publications are sort of increasingly being associated with one side or the other side. But for me, the great thing about being the reporter is that people shouldn't really know who, if you're a political reporter, if I know who you're voting for, that's a problem and that actually undermines your, your journalism. Um, and, and, and I just think that this sort of, if, you're, if you have a curious mind and, and really want to just learn about the world, there is no better way to do it than being a, a news reporter. You know, when you move over to the opinion side and I moved over, let's say maybe 10 years into my, my career, um, it's liberating in a, in, a, in a different way. You know, you're kind of throwing off these shackles of um, that there that you can you actually you're you should be sharing what you really think about the world, and your role is to um, uh, uh, um, really kind of try and shape the world into what you would wish it would to be, as opposed to reflect what it what it really is. Um, you know, even in the opinion space, there are all kind there there are different types of, of of uh, columnists and opinion writers. There, are, I mean, I would sort of say there are people like, you know, the late Charles Krauthammer or um, Paul Krugman, um, one of my contemporaries or Brett Stevens who kind of write with a, a kind of almost ex cathedra kind of, this is the, what I see, what, what I want the world to be and I'm writing from on high. And there are actually um, a lot of great columnists who are still at heart reporters. You know, I think of sort of uh, uh, Nick Kristoff on, on the center left, I guess Tom Friedman, people who are reporters and still use their reporting skills, but then kind of take advantage of the freedom that you have as a, um, on a newspaper, a columnist, or if you're on radio, more of a kind of commentator to, to really sort of, you, you're still informing people, but you're also informing them with, uh, um, but not hiding your, your worldview. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, any great publication should have both and the world needs both. Um, but it's become increasingly harder to make that division um, uh, clear. You know, there has to be a firewall in my view. And I, I feel like I sound, you know, older than I am when I, when I say this. And, and we have these conversations in-house at Politico all the time. Um, you know, an opinion, uh, a piece of opinion writing or, or a commentary we label it as such, and it's very clear to our audience what this is. And our reporting should never give you a sense of, of which side of the ledger we're from. And I think this is where we're, it goes back to the early days of Politico. Um, the idea was that if you're covering politics, you don't wanna really alienate any team and give them an excuse to stop reading. People in, so we are a publication that is, it's in the name, you know, so this is what we do. We do politics, but it's really intended to be a must read for the people who are players in politics and are trying to influence politics. And if millions of others happen to read it, great. Millions obviously happen to read it too. Um, but to do that effectively and to be um, a must read, whether it's for Mitch McConnell or Nancy Pelosi, you got to keep the opinion and the partisanship out of there. It has no place. We're just, reporters are there to report and to inform. And I do think that we are, um, uh, there is a worthy fight going on to keep those values in place because the media scene is changing so much. And, and there are all kinds of incentives we talk about later of why um, certain media outlets are probably are tilting one way or, or the other. So you, you started in the news uh, part, then you moved over to the editorial as a columnist, but then you've come back to the news site. Is that an adjustment and a challenge? Because when you were a columnist, if you will, you sort of put on display some of your views, um, but then you sort of have to put the cloak back on, for lack of a better term, when you come back to the news. Was that a challenge? You know, frankly, I actually thought it would be, and I thought it would come up more often uh, uh, that it has, and it hasn't really, because um, one thing I always say, like I can spot opinion from a mile away, you know, so I can spot it in a, in a, in a news story or, um, so I'm quite sort of vigilant about it. I, I do think these are just different, um, uh, they're different muscles that you're using. And, and I think that if you're doing your job as an editor properly, as an editor of a news publication, or if you're doing your job as a reporter properly, um, 
those muscles should never be stimulated, the, the opinion muscles, because uh, it, it, all it does, it, it undermines what you're trying to do. It sort of dilutes your efforts to produce reporting that's frankly hard hitting because you're talking to the right people, you're keeping an open mind about what the story is. Um, it, it, it also, you know, I, I remember Johnny Apple, who's the late Johnny Apple, is a New York Times um, columnist, a uh, uh, sort of re reporter, um, you, you used to say that, you know, um, uh, again, you should, should never be able to tell what a report, if, if a re reporter is doing their job properly, you have no idea what their actually personal politics are. And, and I do deeply believe that. I, I, I think the best reporters are, first of all, incredibly curious people. Um, uh, secondly, they're incredibly competitive people. You know, this is not a profession. Again, there's all types in journalism like there is in any walk of life. I think it's journalism especially, but there are some kind of common traits. The best reporters are, tend to be the one that are just basically just so sort of dying to get the story ahead of someone else. And they may kind of, you know, push their mother out of the way to kind of get the story, but but they're, they're really sort of fighting uh, to get the story. And if you are processing the story through some filter of, you know, well, I think the world should be like this, or I, I really don't like these people, then actually that gets in the way. And I, I found, and I found sort of going back into that, I've sort of realized that actually it was very easy to sort of switch over. You know, the, the real challenges for me, frankly, were more um, getting my head around, um, you know, how do you build a business around journalism? How, how do you sort of keep true to your values of what you think editorially is 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 important um, and make this work as a going um, uh, financial concern, you know. So so that was the bigger challenge that I hadn't really quite anticipated, but it wasn't the opinion versus news at all. I, I do want to move on to some other stuff, and we're getting at some questions in from from the viewers as well. But let me just ask you one more element of this: the the news analysis pieces. Um, th there seems to be a, a, a growing push for these kind to try to explain to readers or viewers what is behind a story. Are, are those, do, do those kind of try to bridge the gap or are the still strictly news? You know, I'll, I'll invoke Johnny Apple again because he used to do those things a lot called yeah. the Q head. And yeah. um, in the times it was sort of on, on top of, above the fold. Um, and I think again, if done properly, uh, those should begin be, uh, again, and I wouldn't really trust um, all reporters to be able to do this, but I think where you are giving someone who's a proven, uh, proven, you know, that, that, that they've done this for a long time, they can write with authority, but to write with authority about something, uh, you have to understand the dynamics. But I think, again, you have to kind of keep out the, um, the, the sort of personal politics. Because it's probably, yeah. let's just use example of a previous president. There are moments where you would say, you know, Donald Trump, he is winning on his own terms. This is why, this is his strategy going forward. Um, uh, and, and, and this is what they're talking about in the White House. And this is informed by an understanding of, um, of, of politics, of the people around him. It should always be informed by reporting. And then we do want, I think, I would say maybe more senior, but more seasoned people to, to sort of be able to, sort of, to be sort of just call it the way it is. But calling it the way it is in a repertorial sense is different from calling it the way it is if you're a left wing or a right wing columnist. And, um, and I think that again, this, this applies to politics. Uh, it's actually easier done if you're a, a business journalist or a science journalist, because it's not, I mean, politics is everyone's got an opinion about it. And it's like sort of commenting about sports, you know, you kind of know the score, but interpreting how you got there, everyone's got their own opinion of it. Um, and in business reporting, you really have to kind of stick to, to hard, hard reporting. But even in, in, in political reporting, um, the great reporter, you still should not be able to tell that, you know, this person, you know, wears a MAGA hat, you know, to bed at night or, or, or they, um, you know, have a uh, burn, the, burn Trump in effigy every evening with their family in the backyard. Frankly, the best reporters should do neither um, because uh, they're they're probably cynical enough, and they just they just it's, it's a waste of time, you know. But I I do think that really good political analysis should be grounded in understanding of politics, not in an opinion about politics. Everyone's got an opinion about politics, you know. I keep telling our reporters, our readers don't really care about your opinion, with all due respect. 
they care about whether you are telling them something they didn't previously know, whether you're kind of shedding light on what's really going on in Washington or in the New York City mayoral race. And they, that they can't find uh, uh, as easily somewhere else, which is why they come to, uh, to Politico. So let, let me turn to a little bit of the, of the business side of things and the ability of news outlets to remain sustainable. And, and, and I was struck um, uh, the other day, I think it was uh, Brian Klass in, in, uh, in Washington Post had, had provided some statistics, if I can put my fingers on them quickly. Um, in the past 15 years, he wrote, half of all local journalists disappeared from newsrooms due to layoffs and budget cuts. A quarter of all newspapers have died. Um, and I'm curious, how has Politico uh, managed these challenges in the news business these days? I mean, ever since our birth in the US in 07 and in, uh, I think, uh, and in Europe in 15, we've grown at 20 plus percent every year in revenue terms. We turn profitable pretty early on and we have a really robust business. And again, it's, and I actually don't think it's necessarily, I mean, I think it's obviously we, we do something that's smart, but I think there's a common thread to the media companies that do succeed. And unfortunately, there's probably a common thread to the ones that do not succeed. Um, you know, I think local journalism is something that, um, people still haven't figured out, but a lot of smart people are trying. You know, there's um, someone in Washington who's doing kind of a combination of uh, local city podcasts plus a newsletter that's supposed to have, it doesn't replace a full newsroom where you have dozens of reporters who, you know, uh, uh, track the police or go to school board meetings, but it is an attempt. Um, uh, there are other places that are trying to use different models. Unfortunately, since we live in a capitalist society, uh, um, you know, we, we do need, I think great journalism needs to be sustained by a great business model. And that's something that's been kind of, uh, been a reminder and that's been reaffirmed by uh, the last couple of years. Um, the thing that people that I think um, that media companies that succeed and there's all kinds of different models, you know, our, our business model is a, um, combination of very high-end subscriptions that are B2B. So we sell to businesses, not to people, information about you know, policy developments around technology or energy in Washington or in Sacramento. And then we have a, um, a lot of, we have a sort of advertising supported platforms, which are our homepage, our newspaper, all our podcasts, newsletters, all this stuff. So, you know, that's a different model. It's, it's, it's a unique model. It's a different model than, than the New York Times has, which is now increasingly a consumer subscription model um, that is, has, they still have a newspaper, they still have advertising, but they are trying to be the Netflix of news. You know, that they have now, I think, 6 million people who subscribe to the New York Times and get all these different services and they're, and they're sort of growing incredibly fast. Um, I think the common threads to the ones that are working is um, a clear idea of, of what your mission is as a media company and how it's unique. You know, what can you, what are you offering that others aren't offering as well? And then connecting that with a clear idea of who your audience is, you know, and, and sort of building that relationship. And oftentimes you're not actually fighting for money um, you're actually fighting for people's time. You know, when, when you subscribe to something online because, oh, this is useful to me, I'm gonna keep coming back to this uh, over and over again. And the cost is, you know, at the end of the day, the cost of the New York Times subscription is per day less than you probably pay for the, for the print newspaper and you're probably getting more because there's increasingly more services online. So again, having a model where, you know, the, the what you're, let's see, too far into business speak, but what your product is and matching it up with what the market actually wants, it's, it's as simple as that. And I think maybe with local news, something similar needs, needs to happen. You know, this is working very well for my old home, the Wall Street Journal, where, where they've had great growth, especially recently, because they've said, you know, we are a, um, a source of news, but also a, a something that if you are a businessman in America, you need to engage with us throughout the day and get not just the news, but other things. And, um, and, and I think sort of, you know, this is, 
you know, the, I think the thing that we misunderstood about the sort of turn of the 20th century, 21st century and the rise of the internet, it didn't herald the death of journalism. People increasingly are saying that they wanna consume content. And the beauty of the death of the, maybe the, the print newspaper as a standalone product, yes, that has disrupted a lot and unfortunately cost a lot of people their jobs and a lot of great papers have gone under, but it's also made it possible to reach millions of people across the world at almost zero cost. And if you can kind of match up with what you're providing them in terms of great journalism or great stories or amazing crossword puzzles, what have you, you can probably figure out some, uh, um, some way to kind of pay for it. And it's really gratifying to see that a lot of people have. We're, we're, we're not alone, obviously. Yeah, just a quick side note, uh, you, you mentioned about the dying breed of a hard copy of a newspaper. Um, <laughs> It was very heartening to see, though, overnight in Hong Kong, uh, I think a million copies of Apple Daily were printed and sold out very, very quickly um, in a tribute to that uh, uh, very courageous news outlet that the uh, yeah, Hong Jim Kong and Chinese Communist Party authorities are really attacking. Um, I, let me ask you one more question, then I'll turn to some of the questions that we have here, and I'll save for the end, Alex Vargas has a question about internships, um, and, okay. which will lead me to advice you might have for, for journalists, not specifically an internship with Politico, but uh, although I'm sure Alex would appreciate one. Um, it, the, the, the question I wanted to ask is, um, some people are saying that the a term I don't like, but let me use it nonetheless, mainstream media um, were overly harsh on the previous administration and are too soft on the current administration. Curious to get your assessment of how you respond to that kind of criticism. And what was it like covering the previous administration when you had the president um, accuse, again, to use the term uh, mainstream media, of fake news and being the enemy of, of, the, of the people? I mean, I think to your first question, I guess, I would say from our, from maybe I can speak on behalf of Politico, which is what I can speak on behalf of what sure. I know as well. Um, you know, the, we're as tough on, on Biden as I think we were on, 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 on Trump. Um, we're, we haven't been known to be easy on politicians with politicians are complaining about you. It means you're probably doing something right. And I always, I find it gratifying when I hear from both sides uh, yelling at me about something we, we, we've done. It means you're doing something, something right. I, I think the broader critique is, uh, I guess I would say, give it a few, you know, people are going to sour on this president uh, because things are not going to go that smoothly. Um, and um, journalists are not drawn to uh, good news stories. Um, and and uh, generally, and, and I think if you talk to the White House press office, they would say, are you kidding me? They're killing us. You know, they're so unfair in their description of, of this or that or the coverage of, of, of this. And Yes, we do have now in this country, you know, certain uh, cable news outlets that are much clearly on more of this side and the other ones are on that side. But again, if it comes to journalism, to actual journalism, which I would differentiate from cable news sort of blather, um, all the respect to my friends in cable news, we love when they have our people on the air. Um, uh, it, 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 ultimately, good journalists are motivated to uh, break stories and to make sure that their stories stand out. And, and this is where if you do a, um, no one wants to do a soft story that will be panned by their colleagues the next day. So, you know, the, the incentive structure within journalism, I think is gonna keep us pretty honest in terms of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, doing tough work, tough but fair, um, work on on whoever's in power. That's the that's the role of the media in our society and in any democracy, you know. And and I I don't know. I, I I don't really. I think this is kind of it's always become this national parlor game to complain about the media and its biases and blah blah. blah. I, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, uh, journalists want to break news. They want to break stories. They want to do do work that is going to be read because it tells you something that again you didn't previously know. Um, you know, the change from the Trump era to the Biden era has obviously been kind of jarring for a lot of, a lot of journalists, you know, especially the ones in Washington, because it's been, yes, you know, he was 
always insulting journalists and, and yes, he, he was, you know, tweeting things at all times of the day and he kept, he ruined our weekends uh, all the time and he kept you off balance. He also made the political story in Washington, this story of the world and, and, uh, the, ret and, and the return or the, you know, I always find that American politics, you know, the presidency sort of swings in these pendulums, you know, that you get the kind of the very opposite of what you had before. So the very opposite of that is this, which is, you know, where the most interesting story in Washington is, you know, the, the infrastructure bill and, and, and whether like Biden has misstepped by uh, uh, promising to pass the, the budget reconciliation package of the, that's going to keep the progressives happy um, along with something that's a bipartisan bill. Um, it, it, it's that's not gonna get you, you know, the 3 million clicks on your website and it's it's done terrible things to cable news ratings, you know, uh, um, you know, everyone's traffic is is down. Uh, but I always tell our people that this is actually a great moment for serious political journalists, serious journalists in Washington, that this is where you show how good you are because, you know, Trump, the Trump story was almost too obvious. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a show. I mean, he's an incredible showman. And, and, and the Biden by design is, is meant to be boring, but it's not boring. It's actually very, very interesting and important because we're potentially you know, remaking um, some of the foundations of the American economy and American society. And, and, and that's a really important story. So um, I, I found the last thing about Trump, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I spent maybe too much of my time reporting in Putin's Russia or out of the Middle East to, uh, to, to think that what we were living through here was um, um, something which was, okay, no president should attack the media. I say this as me, I say it as, as the editor of, of Politico, but I, I, I guess, um, you know, the Republic did, did, did survive somehow and, and, and here we are complaining about how it's boring, so. <laughs> Um, let me turn to a few questions from viewers and uh, and then we'll end with um, advice you would give for aspiring journalists out there. Uh, and Lynette Brightwell picking up on our earlier chat about Europe versus uh, the United States says, Europe embraces uh, their history, but America is experiencing a time where it is staying, where it, sorry, where it is trying to erase some history. Do you feel this is a true statement? Um, uh, I think I wouldn't get into the, into the politics that's in, implicit in that question. I guess I would only, <laughs> only sort of re, re, remark that um, it's a cliche, but it's a true one that I think sort of um, as a European, and I guess I would say that I'm in some ways a, a European, you know, you're much more aware of, of where you came from and that sort of the inertia is pulling you back. Uh, and, and, and change is something that, that is not embraced. Whereas the beauty of America is this feeling that every day is a blank sheet of paper. And, 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 and it can, I do think that happens to be true. And I think that this is why a lot of, how, why Europeans have been drawn to America for over 400 years. Uh, and that this feeling that you are kind of said, you know, taking those shackles of the past off and are coming to a place where you can really, you know, I, I, this is the, the, the naive immigrant in me speaking, but uh, I, I think, you know, there's still a place where you can really become who you want to be if you have the, the grit and the energy and, and, and the smarts. And I think that that's still possible. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of debates about, the debates about history in America are actually not debates about history, they're debates about the future. And that's probably usually true, but I, I, I think because, because they are, it's an open conversation, whereas in Europe, you don't really talk about the history, it's just there, it's sort of weighing you down and weighing everything down. We're talking about it here and we're arguing about it because we're actually fighting over the, the future. So I think that is, um, is actually consistent with what I was thinking about the US that sort of the sort of future is to be made and we're all faced toward it. And, and, and that's just a feature of America that people who are drawn to America, I, I think that people find um, very attractive. Um, Marielena Villar um, listened attentively and said, uh, you just said science reporting is easier because everyone has an opinion like politics, as opposed to covering business that is based on hard facts. 
as science becomes so po uh, politicized that covering it is indistinguishable from covering politics. That is significant in this area where when public health and environmental issues are at the forefront of the news. No, I'm, I'm sorry if I misspoke there. I think science reporting is actually very, very hard. And, and, and we, um, I've hired actually a couple of PhDs even to sort of be, be, be health policy reporters for us and, and then do kind of reporting on, on climate and other things. Um, to the degree that everything is being politicized these days, yes, science has been politicized. It's been politicized during the pandemic. It's uh, the, the sort of post-pandemic. Um, I think that's inevitable when you when it becomes part of the the debate in the public square, and I would distinguish just the stories that fall there, which is, you know, did this administration miss screw this up or not screw this up in terms of its response to this or that, or you know, should we be looking harder at the roots of the China of, of the of the of the virus in China itself? That's a political story for me. Um, the, the science story and the hard science story is actually, that's where we, and I think a lot of media outlets um, would prioritize um, um, people who have expertise and are some ways so sort of specialized. I do think if you're writing about economics, science, business, um, uh, it's harder to do that well because you actually have to do, there are no easy shortcuts in that kind of reporting. And again, Political reporters take shortcuts, tend not to be the great political reporters, but to do a good business story or a good science story, you better know what you're talking about. Because if you don't, um, and you were at the Wall Street Journal, that could cost someone you know, millions of dollars in, in a faulty stock trade. So we were taught very, uh, um, uh, very early on, not just to make sure that we knew what we were writing about. Um, I think on science too, you really, you really want people who, who know what they're doing and know what they're saying. That's actually why I, I find that kind of reporting very appealing. Great. Well, Matt, let me let me wind up here by um, you know we've had we've had Marty Barron kick off this series. Um, he had just stepped down as editor in chief of the Washington Post. Uh, Monica Richardson, who's the new executive editor of the Miami Herald, Ramon Escobar, a senior VP with CNN for talent development and recruitment. Mm -hmm. And I've asked each of them this question and I, I will ask it to you too, but I'll also work in Alex's question here um, uh, by can someone uh, gain reporting experience without an internship? If so, how? Uh, which leads to the question I ask each of our guests, uh, what advice do you have for aspiring journalism students out there? Um, I think the best advice I ever got was, you know, you become a journalist by by doing journalism, and and the beauty of doing journalism is, I think, um, uh, it's it's you don't need a medical um, degree to do it. Um, you just, uh, I, I think, having a passion for the world, uh, for learning, for um, asking hard questions, and and I do think it's important to sort of to actually see it as a craft. Um, I, um, I, I, I had an old, my early editors at, at the Wall Street Journal said, you know, reporting is like being a shoe cobbler. And I was like, oh, how dare you say that? You know, I didn't, my parents didn't pay for all these damn schools. And, and uh, you know, I consider myself, but he's like, you know, no, you can kind of, you, you basically like a shoe cobbler learns how to cobble shoes. And the more they do it, the better they get at it. And you cobble certain kinds of shoes, different kinds of shoes. And, Again, it was, it was meant <laughs> somewhat facetiously, but I think there's something to that, that really doing it, that practicing it um, and having opportunities to do it. I would say start, um, you know, I, I spent probably too much of my undergraduate years in my you know, college newspaper and, and some of my best friends to this day, but probably the things that I kind of learned about journalism came from that experience. It was a really great college newspaper and, and that's, a great news, that's, a, that's, that's a great experience at many schools. Um, you know, doing, getting any kind of experience in reporting or writing or podcasting or video, uh, it doesn't matter actually, especially early on, it doesn't matter what you are covering as long as you're doing it and you're getting the experience from it. And I think being lucky to find some mentors, whether it's a good professor in school or a, an editor you come across, um, that is really the, the 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 thing that kind of you know this is part of 
you know, you come out of school and you're still continuing your education and having sort of the right people help you down that road. Um, so no, I don't think you need to have an internship. There are many other ways to get experience, but it is the experience that, that um, uh, creates great reporters. You know, things have changed. And I think the last thing I would wanna just highlight on this is that this profession, like a lot of our professions is uh, changing much faster than it ever did before. Um, and I think they're sort of being open to that. There's not a set way of doing journalism. You know, we hire a lot more people now who are uh, great coders. You know, we we have a whole video team, which is fantastic. You know, we've got all these new skills that come in the newsroom because people, because journalism is being transformed. So I think keeping an open mind about what it means to be a journalist and what it will mean to be a journalist in, in, the, in the future should be part of this. And I think as you're, if you're interested in, in, in the future in, in journalism is I, I would just find opportunities to do it. Um, and it doesn't really doesn't matter like if you're on the White House team or covering the local school board or um, if you're um, doing graphics or if you're writing 2000 word stories. Uh, these are all very sort of related skills and, and, and figuring finding places to hone those skills, that's the most important thing. Well, I was the, uh, in my senior year in college, I was the editor of the Tufts Daily. So, uh, but wow. I took a different path from there, but- uh, You still graduated, so. <laughs> I still graduated, amazingly yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah. But it's amazing for many reasons. Um, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, well, Matt, I, I do, as John said, uh, you and I traveled to Ukraine together. I think that was the first time we met in person. And uh, uh, we went to Crimea before it was uh, illegally occupied and annexed by Russia. Um, and uh, that was a great trip, and uh, we, we both come a long way uh, since yeah. that time, but uh, incredibly grateful to you for taking the time to join us here today to continue this uh, series, which we think is really important for our students and the broader community as well, so a huge thanks uh, to you for, for joining us today. Thank you, David. It's always a pleasure to, to be with you all, and I look forward to being with you in person soon. I indeed, indeed. My thanks to my colleagues and friends at the School of Communica Communications, and of course my own school, uh, the Stephen J. Green School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, I'm David Kramer. This has been our latest in the series, The Role of the Media in Contemporary Society. Stay tuned for information about our next session. Uh, thanks again, Matt, for joining us, and thanks to all of you for joining as well, and have a good weekend.